Not me. I hope the, the Holy Spirit. If you get anything out of this, it's from the Holy Spirit. My greatest fear, my greatest fear is when I stand up here to waste your time. Okay? If you get one word, one phrase, one thought, the Holy Spirit moves on you today, just one little nugget, then the Holy Spirit's done His job. But it's for me, I'm just me. I pray the Holy Spirit guides what I have to say. Because I do not want to waste your time. I could be fishing today. It was a beautiful day on the coast yesterday. I could be worshiping God. What? I was yesterday. It was great. I was in my kayak, had my feet kicked up on the front of it, just floating out there, looking in the water, gentle breeze, the humidity was down. You could be doing anything else today, but you took your time to get up this morning, get ready, and come up here. So the last thing, my greatest fear in life, is to waste your time because you came here this morning. So as I go through this stuff, y'all pray for me. That as I try to pull all this crazy stuff together that I run through my mind and I try to write it down and then I try to organize it somehow, some way, that the Holy Spirit will use it, even though it's not me, use the words that the Holy Spirit says to help you in some way. I read that first verse. And it said, created man out of the dust of the ground. Then in, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 19, it says this, In the sweat of thy face shall thou eat bread. So this is after the fall. Man had it made, man. Just they, they, Life was good. Didn't have to do anything. Life was good. But they failed. Sin. Sin entered in. But in the sweat of thy face shall thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken. For dust thou art, until dust shall thy, thou return. Story goes, and I know every one of you probably heard this little story. A little, a little just a little, little story. Not true. Probably could be, though. Sounds like something one of my grandkids would say. The little boy is sitting in the service and, and, and the preacher preached on dust. You came from dust and you're going back to dust. The dust where you form, dust you're going to return. We all will live and die, then we're going to turn back to dust. Back to the ground from where we came. And the little boy was tugging at his mom after the service and said, Mom, I've got to talk to the preacher. I've got to talk to him. She said, okay, we'll go. So the little boy got him over to the preacher. The little boy got there and said, Preacher, you have got to come to my house. There is so much dust under my bed that there's either somebody coming or there's somebody going, and I don't know which. <laughs> so dust, I'm sorry, dust to dust. Don't know whether you're coming or going, and I don't know sometimes whether I'm coming or going. So, so anyway, the Bible says this. I'm going to move on. Look, Dad, we started with dust. God created us. Then I will go to Jeremiah, and then I will start trying to get into what I'm doing. Let me read Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 18, verses 1 through 6. I'm going to try to bring this full circle. Maybe I'll make it to the end. Jeremiah. Verses 18, I mean chapter 18, 1 through, 8, 1 through 6. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will call thee to hear my words. Sometimes we have to see it for the words to sink in. My daddy always talked about a, uh, a, a young private. I will go on and read in a second, I'm sorry. The young private, they were in, in boot camp and uh, they were digging the trench. And uh, the lieutenant come up and said, Young man, I want you to dig this hole over here. And he said, I ain't going to do it. Now, this is a private talking to, to the lieutenant. He said, I ain't going to do it. He said, Son, I want you to dig that hole. He said, no, I ain't doing it. By that time, the drill sergeant stepped up. He said, Sir, can I handle this? Said, go ahead, sergeant. 
he walked inside the head twice and grabbed him by the seat of the britches and threw him over there and said, dig that hole. The lieutenant said, yes, sir. And he started digging. And the lieutenant asked him, private, said, why didn't you dig it when I asked? And the, and the young private said, because he explained it a lot better than you. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes we have to see to understand. And that's what God did with Jeremiah. He took him down there. He said, then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought and worked on the wheels. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred. And in the hand of was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again, another vessel, that seemed good to the potter to make it. And verse 6 says, O house of Israel, can I, I do with you as this potter? Saith the Lord, Behold, as the clay is in my in the potter's hand, so are ye in my hand, O house of Israel. Mm -hmm. God's dealing with the house of Israel. They're clay. He's trying to mold them and make them into something. Any of you ever work <coughs> on a potter's wheel or, or, or making something in school and stuff and you got wet clay and you 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 can get it spinning, you know, now they got electric stuff, you know, back in the day you had to do a little foot pedal. Like a sewing machine. How many of y'all will never remember the singer sewing machine? <laughs> <laughs> you get that thing, I know Mary Ellen, you still got one? I know you do, that's good. And so, that's what God is saying to Israel. Like I say, y'all stay with me. Stay with me. If you can catch one thing out of all that I'm going to say, because this is a wild ride, okay? Stay with me. That clay, the house, the nation of Israel, is clay in, the, in God's hands. And He's trying to mold them and make them a people to honor and love and serve Him. That's all He wanted. He wanted a, a friend, someone that would honor Him for Him, not go after serving other gods. Y'all that have come on Wednesday night, we've been talking in, in um, Judges about the nation and about finally God said, listen to me. He said, I'm tired of it. He said, I'm tired of it, Israel. He said, I told you to drive those other people out and you didn't do it. You wouldn't do it. You let them stay. You started making them slaves and servants in your houses and you started charging them taxes and you were making money off of them and you were using them. And I told you, I told you to drive them out. Don't let their gods, don't let their customs affect you. But you didn't do it. And so he said, fine. Tell you what I'll do. I'm going to leave them right there. I'm going to leave the Philistines, the, the Canaanites, and the Perzites, and the Zebuzites, and the Trilobites, and everybody else that was in that land. I'm going to leave them right there, and they're going to try you. <coughs> There will be a thorn in your side. They're going to bother you all their days. What's happening today? That's in the nation of Israel. We've been talking about it. They're all cousins. <laughs> they all want that land. It's going to be a thorn in their side forever because you didn't do what I told you to do. You didn't drive them out. You kept them. And then not only that, he said this interesting thing. He said, no, I'm going to leave them there to test you to see whether you will truly serve me. And of course, in the book, book of Judges, you realize they'll serve for a little while and then they'll fall away. They'll serve for a little while and then they'll fall away. And God will have to raise somebody up. He said, I'm also going to leave them there to teach you war. Teach you how to fight, how to take charge, how to defend yourself from those who would do you harm or do you bad. They're going to, you're going to learn war because of the, and did they learn war? It was used, the word war in two different meanings was used, there was two different types where you're actually in conflict and battle. It was used 319 times, I think. And the word war where it was actually soldiers and so on, military campaigns and everything was used 421 times in the Bible. That's a lot war. So God is using that. He said, just like the potter, I can, I can make another, but I'm still trying to work you, work you. 
Proverbs chapter 14, verse 34 says, Righteousness. Anybody ever heard a guy named <coughs> excuse me, Tim Lee? Tim Lee lost both of his legs in Vietnam in, in, um, in a landmine. Last day. He, he was fixed, he was shipping out, and he walked point that day. He didn't have to. He was in charge of the whole platoon, and he didn't want to see he had a bunch of green recruits, and he, not, he would not let them walk it. He walked point himself. Took a landmine with most of his legs on. If you ever get a chance to hear his sermon, righteousness exalted the nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Proverbs says that. Righteousness exalted the nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. A great sermon. If you ever get a chance, look it up. Tim Lee. God, God and country, I think, is the name of that sermon. Then Proverbs 11, 11 says, By the blessings of the upright, the city is exalted, but it is overthrown by the word, by the mouth of the wicked. How much of y'all, how many of y'all watch the news every day? <laughs> okay. How many of us you listen to politicians? Oh my gosh. It's tough. It said the city is overthrown by the mouth of the wicked. Be careful. Be careful. And you know, we're dealing with countries now and cities and so on and forth. I'm going on down the line. I'm going, to, I'm going to get to us here shortly. You know, Abraham. And you think about this. You think about America. Oh, it's so wicked. It's, but this is still one of the greatest countries on the face of the earth right now. Because God blessed it. You know, um, I asked people on June the 6th, what's the day? What is the day? D-Day. Most people, you know, it was D-Day. 80 years. We forget. We forget. Abraham pleaded for Sodom and Gomorrah. God said he was going to go in and destroy, destroy Sodom and Gomorrah for the wickedness that was in there. And Abraham said, well, God... You know, it's good that Abraham could talk to God that way. You know, we ought to, you know, honor God, worship Him, pray with Him daily. It should be a personal relationship. Abraham said, God, God you know, there might be a few good people down there. You know, well, say, say there's 50. God said, you know what? I'll, I'll save the whole cities of Sodom and Gomorrah for 50, 50 good people, 50 righteous people. Abraham said, well, might not be 50. What about 40? And Abraham went on down the line until 10. He said, God, if there's 10 righteous people and all of those millions of people, will you save it? He said, for 10 sakes, I will save it. And there what? There wasn't 10. That's how wicked and immoral that in the cities were. And then the fire fell down and destroyed it. In America today, it looks bad, but, you know, old, old Elijah, you know, but he was, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm not used to wearing electronic devices. I can't even operate my phone most of the time. But anyway, um, Elijah, he, he destroyed the prophets of Baal and the keepers of the grove, 700 and something people. One of them, the fire fell from heaven and devoured the stuff, the sacrifice, the wood, the water, and everything else. And then one woman, Jezebel, said, I will get you, and he took off running. You know what? I, you know, I don't know. He took off running. And he and he got out there weeping and moaning and got self-pity and everything else. And God said, get off your face. There's seven, seven thousand men. That have not bowed a knee to Baal. Have not bowed. And you don't even know about it. Get off your face. Come on. And in America, there's little churches, big churches, all spread across this country right now where people, there are good people that are praying and worshiping and praising God for who He is. That's what's kept America where it's at. So anyway, Abraham pleads for it. They got destroyed. So that's countries. We're 
we're part of a country. But God can take down a country. Remember, always remember this. Remember Nebuchadnezzar. I'm going to talk about him in the very end. But now, even you go down to churches and states and cities, I mean, to, to nations and countries and everything else, and now you get down to, to a church. We're part of a church. We're part of a local church. The church is one body, but it's many members. Let's see, why did I write down here? I have no idea what I wrote down here. Oh, I know what it was. Uh, let's see if I can find that. I'm going to apologize. I got some of this stuff marked and some of it I know. Well, anyway, it says so this. It, it's, the, um, it's in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, I believe. 1 Corinthians 12, 14. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot's the same, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? And he goes on and talks about that. That's our church. We're one body, but we're many members. We have many things that we're responsible for as a church. But a lot of us only have a couple of things that we're responsible for the body. Think about that for a second. You can't do everything. You've got to keep, as the church goes, we keep Christ as the head. If Christ is not the head of the church, we got nothing. Because it, the rest of the body, all fits together. Christ is the head, controls the rest of the body. Every member is supporting the other. Okay? When one is out of sorts, the whole body is affected. How many of you ever got up in the middle of the night get into the bathroom and take your little toe and your toe next to it right between the chair legs. <laughs> yeah. That hurts. And it affects you, your whole body, right? You've done that, haven't you, Mary? you never done that? I have. It hurt. It'll bring you to the floor. It'll bring you to the floor. Yeah. It'll bring you to the floor. Yes, it will. And so, so when... As a, as a church, we're, we're all groups. We're, we're, we're many things. We all have something that we can do for the cause of Christ. And not only is our church, it's a local church. There's many other churches that we shouldn't be warring against one another. I used to tease about churches, you know. They're not, you know, this church over here is doing good, and then for, for a while, and this church over here is doing good, and this church is doing good. And you go around, and it's the same people. All they're doing is switching the goldfish from one bowl to the next. We're not getting people saved. We're just switching the goldfish from one bowl to the next. Whichever one's got the things happening. If we'll focus on getting people saved, and like the, home, the homeless people and others that are out there, they just need Christ. The girl that ran over Evelyn's trash can and threw it in the ditch, she needs Christ. <laughs> You just, they need Christ. And so as a body, when we're as a group, a local church, this is our local church. We're part of this local church. We are parts in it. We're the different, the feet, the hands, the fingers. You know, everybody can't be the same thing. But when one body is hurting, like someone passes away, uh, like Andrea's dad, and, and Miss Vicky is sick, and others are have storm damage like Miss Jeanette and George and others that had things. We're all hurting because that's part of our body. That's the body of Christ. We've got to pray for them. We've got to love one another. We've got to do things we can do to help one another. Let's see, I'm doing really well. I guarantee y'all I'll have y'all out here y'all be well ahead of the line at the buffet line with Methodist. Methodist could be behind them. So anyway, we're the church. Nation, God deals with nations. A group of people. God deals with churches. 
a group of people, a local church. But he also, this is where I'm trying to get to, he deals with individuals. Romans chapter 9. I'll only read two verses from this. It's really the whole thing would be put in here. Paul said this. Start with me see where am I reading. Verses um, 18 through 21. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy. Talking about God. It's God's choice. Why, why is he rich and I'm not? Why is he king and I'm not? Why has he got that and I don't? It's God's choice. We make choices that affect us also, but God has a purpose and plan in our lives. Therefore, have you mercy on whom he have mercy, and whom he will, he, he hardeneth. Thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay, but, O man, who art thou that re repliest against God? Shall a thing formed say to him that is formed, formed it? Why hast thou made me thus? Have not the potter power over the clay of the same lump? Make one vessel unto honor, another to dishonor. I'll give you a quick illustration. Very, very short. My grandson Fisher, he was at his doctor's appointment checkup. I don't know. Last fall, I guess, getting ready, going back to school or whatever. So it's been, you know, pretty good while ago, close to a year. And Dr. Kepp was checking him over and everything else and saying, hey, everything looks good. You're growing good, you know, your, your bones and everything. You, you're healthy. You look, look real good. It looks like you'll be, you know, the way things are right now, it looks like you'll be about six foot tall. And Fisher said this. He said, well, I'd really like to be six three or six four. <laughs> she said, I don't have much control over that. God made him the way he is. So, that's what we do sometimes. Why, why did you make me like this, God? Why did you, you make me this way and that way? Well, God had a purpose. No big thing. God has a plan. We just got to follow it. <coughs> In our lives, I've come to realize this. Peace comes, peace. I'm talking about something in here. Inner peace. Things can be falling apart around you, but you can have something here. You can have an inner peace. A peace that passes all understanding. Peace comes with accepting who we are. How God made us. Who we are. The abilities that God gave us. And our purpose in life. God gives us abilities because of the purpose that He has chosen us for. And when you come to terms with who you are, me, I'm 5'8", got a bad heel, I can still throw a cast in there and run a mullet down with who we are and the purpose that God has made us for. He molded us in making us. When we accept that, then we can have the inner peace all the time. Isaiah 64, 8 says, But now, O Lord, Thou art our Father. We are the clay. And Thou art our potter. We all are Thy. We all are the of Thy hand. We are all the creation, the work of Thy hand. We're what God has wanted us to be. David said in the, in the womb, he knew me already. David said he could travel to the ends of the earth but never leave where God is at. No matter where it was at. Beginning of the day, beginning of the morning, or whatever. We're, we're the work of the Master's hand. Not only do we have purpose, but we also have a place in the body of Christ. You have an individual purpose in your life. God has created you for. And He brought you to this place to fit me together as a church body that we fit everywhere with other churches. <coughs> In this local church, you have a place. You have a part. You may be a little toe that gets caught by the chair in the middle of the night. And when you're hurting, we're hurting too. The whole body hurts. 
Not only do we have purpose, we also have place in the body of Christ. Proverbs 22, 6. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not be <coughs> Crosby, Stills, and Nash. Teach your children. You know that song there yet? That's the door? I think it was Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young for that one. Pray to a child and where you should go and leave his old and want to work from. I'm going to, um, I'm going to read now in Timothy. I've used this scripture in many different ways, but it always it rings so true. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Thou therefore, my son, this is Paul talking to Timothy. Paul laid life at this point. There, thou, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Thou, therefore, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. An exhortation to a young Timothy from an old Paul. The potter's working with a lump of clay, shaping for his purpose, uses tools also. As you go along in life, whether you know it or not, you leave prints on people. You live them. I um, I'm kind of I like to. My wife calls it my rock and stick collection. I like artifacts and stuff. I like old stuff. I've been on walking one year I was out of work, I think somewhere around 1986 for about a month. It's cold, wet, I'm a bricklayer by trade. And uh, I'm all the fish in the main, but, but bricklayer, I lay a lot of brick and block. We were bringing a job out of the ground, we couldn't work, it was cold, wet, rainy every day. Sandy would get up and take the head off with the girl, she was heading to work, taking them to daycare. Or, or, or Sarah, Amy may have been started, Sarah was young. Sarah was born in 85, so she was young then. So I'd get up when they leave every morning and I'd head down to the coast. And I walked everything. That's back when I could walk with it. I walked everything if you're going down to the lighthouse on the pay road. As soon as you pass the East River, there's a dike that goes around and comes all the way back around to Fort Lee and Gray. I know Kelly's probably been back over there going to Fort Lee and stuff. And, uh, but I've walked everything from that dike to the pay road to the to the um, St. Mark's River, all the way out to Four Mile Point. I've been on every island, every sawgrass island, every one that's out there. And I found a lot of neat stuff. I found like 15 salt kilns, the backs of them and stuff like that. Tons of Indian mounds. They're not really Indian mounds, they're, they're trash dumps where the Indians would take and take the broken pottery and throw it in and make a place like this high above the salt mark. And of course, that's where the old timers in the 1850s would put, they break boards of ships in half. I'm sorry I'm giving y'all a little history lesson here, but I'm going to get done real quick. Um, and they would dip it up full of salt water, then they would boil it and scrape the salt. And um, I found a bunch of them and stuff. But the pieces of pottery I would find, there would be designs on them, thumbnail prints, little dots and stuff in the top of the, the pots and all that kind of stuff. They did that with sticks and their thumb and, and other, other rocks and stuff. They make designs in it. Well, that's how we are in our life. We're, we leave prints, and people leave prints on us. Some prints are very deep. Some prints are faint. But we're part of God's plan for molding that clay of another person and for us being molded too. Words, deeds, actions... We'll finish this thing. Everything you do has purpose. <clears throat> Every time you run across somebody in the encounter, that is leaves a print on that person. They may not remember it, may be just a smudge or whatever. Or people that meet you, it may just be a smudge in your eye. Some are deep prints. So everybody that you run across, you're leaving an impression. 
never leave an impression in the molding of your clump of clay that God is forming to make what he wants it to be. We spend our entire life being made for purpose and along the while we're being used. <laughs> so people a lot of times learn better I'll go wrap it up for a moment. People learn better from the actions instead of the words we speak. I was kayak fishing yesterday and uh, and my nephew, John, um, he's 52 now, right? 53, 51, 51. And my <coughs> grandson, Fisher. Truman. He's 10. Not Truman. Fisher, Truman. Truman. Had a grandson, Truman, <laughs> fishing. And so I got to think, we're out there in kayaks and catch hardhead catfish. Any of you have been ever stuck by a stuck <coughs> catfish? <laughs> yeah, very very painful. But he's got to learn. So I started teaching him how to take a catfish off the line. Okay? It starts. He's going to learn by action. I can tell him how to do it all the time, but until he does it, he'll never learn. So I uh, dare with him, start. And that's how people should be in your lives. Take time to show them. Take time to make a difference. Take time for that clay to be molded to be a finer vessel for Jesus Christ. Let's see. I'm not going to tell that story. The turkey story. Y'all heard it before. Huh? It's a, it's, it's, it's a good story, but it's uh, it, it was about people that have made a difference in my life. And it came about because of a turkey hunt. One of the last day of the season, a cool morning, it was perfect, and I was fooling with old turkey, and I was crawling through growing up stuff like this, and he was gobbling, and I'd crawl, and it was a daggum 30, 45 minute ordeal trying to get him just right and everything. But during that time, I can't tell it. But anyway, during that time, God revealed to me people people that made a tremendous difference in my life you can be that person to other people but you got to keep God first in your life to do that I won't go any more in that story anyway we learn and grow by adversity Hebrews 12 5 despise not the chastity of the Lord <clears throat> and, and this one right here this was a song where I talked to my I'm going to, I'm going to, tell, I'm going to recite this and then I'm going to close this up this is a song where I talked to my kids um, when they were small and all of y'all know it he's still working on me to make me what I ought to be took him just a week to make me a song Sun and the earth, Jupiter and Mars. How loving and patient he must be. He's still working on me. The second verse, though, is the one that gets the mirror of his word, reflections that I see, makes me wonder why he never gave up on me. He loves me as I am, and he helps me when I'm playing. Remember, he's the potter, and I'm the clay. God is still working on each of us, no matter your age. This last one, I wasn't going to do this, but this is for Gordon. Me and Gordon come up at the same time. It was an old group. Most of y'all probably don't remember them. That was a crazy group called the Sticks. You remember that group, Gordon? Yeah. yeah. Someone in Jacksonville. Grand Illusion. The song was Sail Away. I'm, uh, come Sail Away. Second line goes, I look to the sea, reflection in the waves spark my memory. Some happy, some sad. I think of childhood friends and the dreams we had. We lived happily forever, so the story goes. But somehow we missed out on 
own pot of gold. But we'll try less than we can to carry on. Now, I don't know the name of the group uh, that did this song. I know Mary Ed and them was George probably know sure. her. Uh, but I'm talking about the um, this song right here. It's um, at the end of broken dreams. People need the Lord. <laughs> the dreams we had as a young person and what we thought and reality at the end is a lot of times different. God stays consistent. So in closing, remember this. God will deal with a nation, a church, and a personal relationship with you. But both a nation, a church, a state, or anything, it all boils down to a person and his or her personal relationship with Jesus Christ. A nation is built of people. A church is built of people. And that thrives according to each individual and their relationship to God. Remember what I told you about King Nebuchadnezzar. God set him up. Children of Cap were in there for captivity. He had a dream. And then he's walking around his palace one day and said, man, look what I have done. Look at all this. I control the entire world. Uh, I control the entire world. That night, he went crazy. He lost the king. Set him out. But he, he ate with the cattle, right? Ate right. grass. The dew fell upon his back. His nails grew out and his hair grew long. And then God... God blessed him and gave him his thought back. And then he praised God. He said, you are the best, the most on the high. You're it. So, remember this, and I can't ever, cl I can't ever close anything without this. All of this starts, starts with a relationship with Jesus Christ. Knowing that you're saved and know God is your Father. Then you can build on that. You can't build. The Bible says the foolish man built on the sand and the storm's life came and washed away. The wise man built on the rock and when the storms came, he stayed. You can't weather this life without Jesus Christ. And that's a personal relationship with Him. It starts there, and then it builds into everything else. But it starts with the individual relationship.